slavery is evil, sinful. The people of Israel knew it. Their story, their history had been forged in slavery in Egypt, then in liberation through the Red Sea to Israel, then later exiled, held captive in Babylon before returning to the homeland of the children of Abraham. Paul knew slavery to be a sin. So why does the word slave feature in today's New Testament reading, a part of his letter to the Christians, the church in Rome? Well, there are two things that we should consider. The first is that Paul, like any good evangelist, tried to tell truths about Jesus to people in ways that they would understand, using language in their experience. Secondly, in our calendar of readings on Sundays, we read the Bible piecemeal. The extract we heard earlier is part of a much bigger section of the letter to the Romans, in which Paul develops his discussion of salvation and the relationship between God and people, relationship enabled through Jesus Christ. We could talk about this larger section for hours. Today, we have about 10 minutes. Paul wrote to people where they were in ways that they could understand. Rome was the center of an empire in which trade was vital. For the Romans, it had led to availability of goods that would not otherwise have been known. It had led to a higher standard of living for very many and great wealth for a number. Rome was a trading empire and so a very transactional society. People bought and sold goods. And yes, they also bought and sold people, slaves. So Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome partly in a transactional way. He wrote that people lived in the slavery of sin. They were subject to and owned by the evil one. Paul tried to get across that even if people felt they were free from the bindings of the Hebrew law and so could do what they wanted, unless they followed Christ, they were in fact beholden to captives of sin. In other letters, Paul writes that Jesus had paid the price for their sin, for our sin. The transaction to attain salvation has already taken place. Now, the theology of how salvation is achieved through Christ is huge and complex. For now, just hold on to the thought that Paul is trying to get across to a transactional society he is trying to say that Jesus paid the price to liberate the slave from their wicked master, the evil one. But you say, Paul is still talking of the saved being at the very least obedient servants, enslaved to God. Yes, to the good master, but still enslaved. And this makes us very uneasy. It is very worrying, which is why we must read the chapters before and after the passage that we heard today so that we can understand the general flow and direction and the true conclusion of Paul's writing. In chapter four, Paul writes of Abraham, who was righteous through his faith in God. He wasn't obedient to God's law. The law wasn't written. He simply believed had a relationship with God and received God's promise. It was through people's sin that that relationship became tainted, distorted, even broken. In chapter six, we heard today, Paul introduced the idea of some form of relationship reforming between God and believers in Christ. He introduced it in a transactional way to a trading people. But then in chapter seven, he develops the idea of relationship a little further 
and in a way that we are more comfortable with. He uses the analogy of marriage. In a good marriage, neither spouse is constrained by the other. But surely, neither is wholly free either. If love underpins the marriage, and love is the unselfish, loyal, benevolent concern for the good of another, then in a loving marriage, the truly liberating relationship is also one where two lives are interwoven. Both spouses are free, yet in love, through love, neither has the selfish license to do whatever they want to the exclusion of what is good for the other. In chapter eight, Paul moves on one more step. Those who are in Christ Jesus, who believe in him, who seek to do his will and the will of God the Father, the one who sent him, those in Christ are also in the spirit because the Holy Spirit of God dwells within us. In our lives, we are led, are willing, even eager to be led by that Holy Spirit. Then Paul writes, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. If we are children of God, then we are heirs. And if heirs, recipients of God's kingdom, joint heirs with Christ. We do not have a spirit, spirit of slavery, but the spirit of adoption. We do not pray in fear of God the master. We pray in love to God our Father. So, through our faith, our belief in God, reconciled to God by the life and death of Jesus Christ, we have a free, firm, indeed unbreakable relationship with the Father, because as Paul closes chapter 8, neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Through Christ, the relationship between God and humankind is reformed. In faith, we believe in the loving God whose steadfast love draws us as children to himself. Through faith in Christ our Saviour, we are reconciled with God and made righteous. We are free. So, let us declare that faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.